We are going to continue uh, in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, and I told you I wish I could tell you how long we'd be here, but I have no idea. It's going to be a while, I think. Um, so before I get started, I did want to mention one thing. A lot of people have been asking me about youth group, and we have partnered uh, with a few other churches, and on Wednesday nights, there's a slide that was up about it. Uh, there is a youth group available for middle school all the way through high school at the crew, uh, starting at 6 and going to 7.30, uh, and we are working in conjunction with some good people uh, and making a lot more available to the youth uh, than we had uh, previously had. Uh, but it's going to give them opportunities to travel places and get involved in certain associations and things that we couldn't do. So uh, we're excited to announce that. So we want to make sure if you have a child of youth uh, group age, or if you're one of them, uh, you are welcome from 6 to 7.30. Okay, now, jumping back into our message. Like I said, we've been in the book of Hebrews for quite a while, and chapter 11, quite a while especially. Uh, briefly, this book was written to Hebrews who were being pressured uh, and persecuted, and the persecution may have came from without, but the pressure was coming more from within their own countrymen uh, because they were being persecuted to mix their faith in Christ with observance of the law, and they knew they couldn't do that because Christ had fulfilled the law. So the author was just trying to encourage them to stay the course and to stay faithful and remind them that other people have been here and God has got them through it. Now today, uh, we're going to continue our study of chapter 11. Uh, known as the Hall of Faith, uh, and last week we began looking at one of my favorite Bible characters out there, and that's Joseph. Uh, and Joseph was the son of Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, uh, and Rachel was his mother. Uh, and so far we've learned that Joseph was his father's favorite son, and he didn't even try to hide the fact that he was his favorite son. Uh, and, I mean, it got kind of ridiculous, actually. I mean, he even made just Jacob, I mean, just Joseph, rather, a multicolored coat, just him, right? Uh, and then he allowed him to be like the supervisor of his brothers while his brothers were working. So in his attempt to show favoritism, he actually, that preferential treatment actually made Joseph's brothers hate his guts, right? So it was really tense among him uh, and his brothers. Now, to make matters worse, Joseph had a dream that his brothers were going to bow down to him. And evidently, Joseph was that weird kid that just didn't have any social skills. Because if you have a dream like that, you don't share it with the people who already are jealous of you and hate your guts. But he thought it was a good idea to share his dream with his brothers and let them know that he dreamed that they would all be bowing to him someday, which made them just love him when he told them that. Um, so they hated him actually all the more after he did that. Now, when the opportunity came, they finally said, we just got to get rid of this guy. Okay, I don't want to put up with him. We want to get rid of him. So they started plotting to kill him. But when the opportunity came, they struggled with the idea of having their brother's blood on their head. So instead, they sold him to some Ishmaelite traders. Uh, and then his brothers took his, his uh, you know, multicolored coat and dipped it in uh, some animal blood. And then they took that back to his father, soaked in blood, and said that Jacob, uh, and told Jacob that Joseph had been attacked, killed, and eaten by a wild animal, uh, which sent their father into a deep mourning and ritual mourning, and uh, the Bible says that he just couldn't be comforted. Now, the Ishmaelite traders who purchased him uh, took him into Egypt and sold him to a man named Potiphar, who was basically the head of security for Pharaoh in our time. That's what he'd have been, his head of security for Pharaoh. Now, this week we're going to see how Joseph's life changed after being enslaved in Egypt, how that affected his faith. So I titled this message, Faithful in Every Circumstance, and this is part one, because uh, we're going to take a look at this next week too. Now, Genesis 39.1, let's jump in. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, uh, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, so because... Uh, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now, his master saw that the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he owned, uh, him, he put him in charge. Uh, or of all that he owned, he put him in charge. It came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, uh, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge, and with him 
There he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. You're going to have to bear with me. I'm struggling with these glasses. I don't wear them very often. Okay, now, anyway, so it was, it was the jealousy of his brothers. Whether you think that it was righteous jealousy, I hear people saying that sometimes, that that was a righteous jealousy. I'm like, I don't think there's any such thing, right? But regardless of what you think of their jealousy, whether he deserved that jealousy or not, they, that it was that jealousy and that bitterness and that anger uh, that put him in this situation. And they figured the way to silence him and to make him ineffective where they wouldn't have to deal with him and see him as a supervisor anymore was to take away his freedom. Now, I don't know if that sounds familiar to you, but it should. It should sound familiar to you because the enemy is trying to do the same thing to believers every day. I mean, we not, may not be sold into literal slavery, but there's a lot of ways to enslave someone. For instance, I mean, the enemy tries to enslave us with things like fear. Have you ever met somebody that fear just dominates their life, keeps them from being the person God wants them to be? Fear is one thing he uses to imprison us. Anger. And I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of angry people right now. Have you guys noticed that? I mean, the world is so uh, divided right now, and this country is so divided, and there's so many angry people, and the devil uses anger to enslave us. Debt. Uh, I think I don't have to say much about that. Debt can enslave us very, very quickly. Uh, and disunity. And he also tries things like discontentment. And if you ever noticed, the world is really good at making you realize what you don't have. Right? But they're not very good at reminding you to be thankful for what you do have. Right? So that's something that can actually enslave us when we become discontent. Uh, he also uses selfishness and pride and addictions. There's so many things that he can use to enslave us, and he's still using that today. Because here's what the enemy figures. He's kind of thinking the same way that Joseph's brothers were. The enemy figures the easiest way to silence us is to use spiritual distractions to take us out of the picture, to get us enslaved to these distractions. Basically, the more focused we are on everything but God, the less effective we will be for God. And that's his plan. See, he loves it when we fight about politics. You know, when I see Christians battling online about politics with people, I always think to myself, listen, you have that right. But just because you can do it, should you? Because, you know, here's the thing. We want people to see the love of Christ, not the bitterness and anger that comes with this world. And unfortunately, right now, we're seeing more bitterness and more anger than anything else. So the enemy loves it when we're fighting over politics. He loves it when we're fighting over religion. He loves it when we're fighting over social and cultural differences. He just loves when we are distracted by the emotions that enslave us. The enemy loves that. And so he constantly uses that because he knows it's impossible. And I don't know if you realize this. It's impossible for angry, resentful people to do anything positive for God. Did you know that? You're not going to do anything positive for God walking around anger and bitter, uh, angry and bitter. Look at James 1, 19 and 20. It says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve what? The righteousness of God. Okay, now this is a tough one. As a redhead, it might shock you. But occasionally my temper steps in, okay, on occasion, right? Now, there's no comments from the peanut gallery, the Lord knows, all right? But I'll tell you, I've never made a decision for God that was pleasing or effective when I'm angry. It just doesn't happen, right? And so the enemy loves it when you walk around angry. You watch things on TV and you're like, oh, whether it's the White House or whether you agree or disagree, and you get all up at arms, and I'm like, yeah, you know what? They don't care what you think. Newsflash, they don't care what you think. They wouldn't throw their latte on you if you were on fire, okay? Yet you will allow them to change your demeanor to the point that you separate yourself from people you love and prospective people that might hear your message. You separate yourself because of anger. So this is one of those things we have to be aware of. And that's why Joseph's life should have been an amazing source of inspiration for all believers, and it should still be, because his life proves that the key that frees us from the prison of our circumstances is faith. That's the key that frees us from the prison of our circumstances. It doesn't matter what's going on in our life. You trust God, God will be with you in that circumstance. And we'll look at that here in just a minute. Now notice that after Joseph was sold as a slave to Potiphar, that God continued to richly bless him because it says everything he touched 
prospered when he was serving Potiphar, right? It caused him to prosper so much so that Potiphar said, you know what, I'm just going to put you in charge of everything. I'm going to let you run everything, everything in my house, everything in my fields, all my businesses, all my property. I'm going to put you in charge of all of it because everything he touched turned to gold, basically. Then after this promotion, God continually kept blessing him. It didn't change anything. It was a good move to promote him because God kept blessing him. Actually, it says it blessed him so much that Potiphar didn't have to worry about anything but what he wanted for dinner. Wouldn't that be a nice life? You know, why can't I have somebody like that? (laughs) You know, where the only thing he said he had to worry about was what he was going to have for dinner. And I think that's absolutely amazing. But think about this. Potiphar had to be thinking to himself and telling his buddies, yeah, that's the the best purchase I've ever made. You know, I was able to see the value in this young man when I saw him climb off the wagon, you know. But it wasn't his business prowess that made Joseph so successful. It was God. And God was not doing it for Potiphar. He was doing it for the sake of Joseph. That's why he was doing it. Now, one thing I think the world doesn't understand about God is that he never abandons his people. If you feel like you're not hearing God or seeing God, it's not because he's not with you. It's because you're not taking the time to hear him. You're not slowing down enough to give him an opportunity to speak to you because God never abandons his people. Even when our friends abandon us, and they will, and our family abandons us, and they will, even when our country abandons us, and they have, right? Even when that happens, God never will. Because regardless of how impossible our circumstances seem, God can still and will still bless us and use us where we are if we have faith. It's that important that we understand that, and we forget that so many times. I mean, you may feel imprisoned by addiction. You may feel imprisoned by debt, like I said earlier, or hopelessness. And you know what? You may be right. You may be imprisoned to that. Because if it's all you think about and it dominates your time and thoughts, you are imprisoned to it. I never understood why people hold grudges. That's something that puts you in prison. You know what I mean? And then you find out later you've held a grudge for six months, and they didn't even think about you, right? So you weren't punishing anybody. So we have to be cautious about allowing things like that to put us uh, into bondage, and these are things that happen. And sometimes when we think we're in prison, we actually are. Now, I've personally experienced all of those things, and I'm telling you, it can be mentally and physically debilitating when you allow yourself to get enslaved to something like that. I mean, with the state of the economy that we're in right now, I think there's a lot of people in prison to debt. There's a lot of people in prison to worry and fear. It's just the state of the economy we live in. We allow ourselves to get pulled into this, and all of a sudden you find, like, you feel hopeless. I can't understand why any Christian would ever feel hopeless. But it does happen, and it has happened to me, so I'm not going to judge anyone. I know how it feels to stress out about finances. I know what it feels like to look at your financial future and go, well... I'm going to retire when I'm 94, you know, and then I have enough to last me three years. I know what that feels like. I know the hopelessness of that. You know, people think that because someone's in ministry, their life's perfect and worry-free, and that's just a lie. We struggle with as much as anyone else with the financial stress, with sin, with emotional baggage. We struggle with all of it, especially financial stress and pride is, is something people in ministry struggle with. Because, listen, very few people go into ministry expecting to get rich. And the people who do, who for some reason think that's going to happen, 99% of them find out that they have a sad realization coming. And people always say, well, what about those people on TV? I'm not talking about charlatans. I'm talking about ministry, okay? Most of the time, you're not going to become wealthy in ministry. And because people expect people in ministry to be perfect, our pride starts kicking in. Right? Our pride starts kicking in, and then we allow that pride to keep us from admitting we're struggling. Someone told me something one time that just stunned me. They said, listen, when you get into ministry, it's lonely. They said it's lonely, and you're going to find out that you will be there for everyone, but it's tough to allow someone to be there for you. Because somehow we believe the lie that we're supposed to be perfect. We believe the lie that we can't tell people about our struggles. But I learned early on, I am not strong enough to do that. You know what I mean? I have to share it, but it's something you have to be cautious of. That's why I always warn young people when they're interested in ministry to check your motives first. Check your motives first. And when I say ministry, it's not just being a pastor. There's ministries, there's all kinds of ministry, right? But always check your motives. And the reason I tell them to check their motives is not that I'm dissuading them from being involved in ministry. It's because ministry puts this big, fat target on you. 
this huge target on your back. And I'm talking about even when you step out at your job to witness, target on your back. Step out on your family, step out with your family to try to you know, live the life in front of them, target on your back. There's going to be a target for people who step out in any kind of ministry. It's just the way it is. And the enemy's going to do everything he can and use everyone he can to discourage you. So he deceives people into thinking that those in ministry don't have the right to prosper. Why? Because the enemy knows if he can get them to feel financially hopeless, they'll quit the ministry. He knows that, right? Or he'll make them quit whatever they're doing, quit the place they work, whatever it may be, because you just want to quit when you feel like you're not advancing. Now, also, the next thing they needed, for, they needed to know is that sometimes you find yourself isolated in ministry and almost feeling like you're living a lie. I've counseled a lot of pastors. I've counseled other people in ministry. And one of the biggest things they tell me is, I feel like nobody knows me. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, I can't tell them that I struggle with this. Then they won't respect me. I can't tell them I struggle with this. Then they won't respect me. I can't tell them. And I, they said, well, what do you do? I said, I tell them everything. <laughs> I'm an open book. Because I tell you what, there's enough stress in life without me trying to live a lie. You know what I mean? But this is what's happening. This is what's happening around us, right? Now, the enemy knows that emotional and psychological stress imprison people's mind. And honestly, I almost think that emotional, you know, being in an emotional prison, I think might be, or a psychological prison, might just be worse than being in a physical one. Because those bars follow you wherever you go. When you're struggling emotionally, when you're struggling psychologically, they follow you wherever you go. But there's no prison, emotional or otherwise, that God can't free us from by faith. And that being said, God can't free us, though, if we're not willing to admit we're in prison. We have to be willing to admit that. All right? Now, we have to really be cautious not to allow pride to get us in trouble. Right, But we, when we finally get ourselves aware of the fact that the enemy's desire is not only to imprison us but to destroy us, it makes ministry a little bit easier. So always be on the alert for the snares and roadblocks the enemy uses. Look at 1 Peter 5.8. It says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So the enemy thinks that if he can distract us with struggles, we will eventually forsake God. And what's sad is sometimes he's right. Sometimes he's right. I mean, sometimes the struggles that come on us make us just want to give up, right? But that mentality, that that attack that the enemy's using doesn't work on people who think like Joseph. Okay, because Joseph was completely committed to his faith and was 100 percent focused on God. And Joseph's Joseph's faith wasn't uh, his faith wasn't dictated by his circumstances. Right. But by God's promises. You know, so every time we we just refuse to abandon our faith, God's going to bless us every time. And every time we resist the enemy, God weakens the enemy and strengthens us. Okay, let's jump back in. Genesis 39, starting verse six B. It says, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph, and she said, lie with me. Do I need to explain what that means? Okay. It wasn't nap time. Just throwing it out there. All right. Verse 8. It's lie with me. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, verse 8. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, Uh, With me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? As, as, uh, As she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her uh, to lie beside her or be with her. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household was there inside. Okay, let me give you a pause. Time to go. Okay? If you want to avoid sexual immorality, don't be alone and put yourself in a situation where that can happen. This is the perfect proof of that. All right? Verse 12. She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. Okay, so 
Because God was blessing Joseph, the enemy had to find another way to trip him up, right? Putting him into slavery didn't do it, right? And giving him more responsibility didn't do it. He still was focused on God, so he had to find a different way to trip him up. And what better way to make a man stumble than with lust of the flesh, Okay, it drives me crazy when people become believers and they say, I'm not even tempted with my flesh anymore. I go, yes, you are, because you're lying like a dog right now. Okay, one of the easiest ways, it doesn't take a genius to know that that's something that easily makes men struggle. And evidently, like his mother, he was exceptionally attractive. Okay, I feel his pain. (laughs) I get it, you know. It's a hard, heavy cross to bear, but some of us have to bear that. But anyway, he was, he was exceptionally attractive, and because Potiphar's wife thought he was hot, she became obsessed with him, and she was constantly trying to seduce him. But Joseph knew that God had been faithful to him and that adultery would be wrong, so he refused to betray God, and he just pushed her away. But despite the fact that he was rejecting her, she continually pursued him, even though it was to no avail. She constantly pursued him. But one day, when she was trying to seduce him, She actually got a hold of him, okay? She grabbed him, so he ran out of there as fast as he could, and she must have had a great grip because when he took off and ran, he left his cloak with her. He ran out of his clothes and ran outside, right? Leaving evidence behind that he would regret, as we will see here shortly. So he ran out of there, right? So What Joseph did here is an excellent example of what Paul told the Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 18. It says, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Now, let me talk about something real quick before I go on with Joseph. Every time I read this, I have to point this out. It drives me crazy how people misuse these verses. It drives me insane. Context determines meaning. Context determines meaning. All right, this is not talking about healthy eating. This isn't talking about not smoking. It's not what this is talking about. This This is talking about sexual immorality. Read the context. When he says your body is the temple, he's not saying don't put extra mayonnaise on your hamburger. Okay? From those of us who love mayonnaise, shut up. (laughs) Right? This is not what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about that. This is talking about sexual immorality, not fried food, camel lights, and soda. That's not what this is talking about. Okay? So when you say the body is the temple, it's talking about keeping your body free from sexual immorality. Now, do some of those other things apply? Sure, they, maybe they could apply indirectly. Not what the passage is teaching. Okay? Just throwing it out there. Follow the context. It's talking about sexual immorality. That will not be on your bills this month. That one's free. Okay. So Joseph understood this concept before it was ever penned by the Apostle Paul. Right? And notice the Apostle Paul said, flee immorality, which is exactly what he did. Right? He says, flee it. And the reason he says flee it is because you know, it's difficult to fight against our natural desires. So he says, as soon as the desire arises, flee from that desire. The longer we allow ourselves to be around any temptation, the harder it is to resist that temptation. We have to remember that. But if we f- flee that temptation, as soon as it arises, it has much less of a chance of taking hold. Right? Listen, when I'm coaching... When, when, the, when we're staying in hotels, if the girls come to my room and they have a question, they have to stay in the hall. I open the door and they have to stay in the hall. Because you don't ever want to put even a, 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 the look of impropriety. Right. You don't even want the look of impropriety. And I've told them, if there's something you need to come in the room, make sure you have a couple people with you. And we're still leaving the door open. Right? Because you got to be careful for the look of impropriety. You know what I mean? And, the, you know, we all know when the temptations are arising for whatever it may be. The problem is we're like, hmm, we want to see how far it goes because we think we're strong enough. Well, I got a newsflash for you. You're not. You stay long enough, you're going to get in trouble. Get out, right? And he knew that. Joseph knew that. He knew that it was time to flee that temptation. That's exactly what he did, right? Now, FYI, this method 
It doesn't just work for sexual immorality, it works for everything, any kind of temptation. As soon as that temptation arises, leave. If you struggle with addictions to alcohol, when they start cracking them open, time to go. They tap the keg, time to go, right? If you struggle with drugs, don't hang around people that do drugs, right? Because you will end up doing them again, right? It's the way it is. And believe me, someone who struggled with addictions before, everyone thinks they're strong enough. Then they end up crying in my office 11 months later. Because if you stay around it, the temptation will overtake you eventually. Joseph understood that, and he got the heck out of Dodge, right? If you want to preserve your, your blessings and you want to avoid God's discipline, know when it's time to leave. Very, very important. I had somebody ask me one time, they said, you know, how is it that you don't get into it with people anymore? I said, because I know when things are going to make me mad and I leave. And if I don't, my wife smacks my leg about four times and says, time to go. <laughs> right? So knowing when to leave is so important. Now, let's take a look at uh, Genesis thirty nine thirteen. This is a perfect example of hell hath no fury. You guys ever hear that one? Like a woman scorned. That's legit. Okay, let's take a look at this. Verse 13. It says, When he saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, she called the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came into me to lie with me, and I screamed. Okay, I thought there was a lot of spin on CNN. Verse 15. When he heard that, uh, when he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. Is that what happened? No, he left his garment in her hand where she was trying to rip it off, right? Make him look like Magic Mike. Okay, verse 16. <laughs> so she left his garment beside her until his master came home. Then she spoke with him with these words, the Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came into me to make sport of me. And as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Okay, so once Potiphar's wife realized that Joseph was not going to give in to her, her advances, she was angry. She became very angry. So she decided to frame Joseph for rape. Okay, and she told the guards, she brings his, his, his uh, tunic out or whatever it was, his garment out. She brings it out and she says, look, here's the evidence that stupid Hebrew he brought in that he's so proud of just came here to use us and he came in to attack me. He tried to rape me, but luckily I screamed and I scared him off, right? That's what she tells him, right? Trying to frame him. Then she tells him that that's evidence. Here's the evidence. So she waits and keeps the evidence until Potiphar comes home and then she tells him the same thing. Look, I don't know, you ever get the I told you so's? Anybody? Anybody ever get the I told you so's? I mean, wives never do that. But in the rare instance that it might happen, right, this is the ultimate one. So she, he, come, he comes home and she says, okay, the Hebrew guy you brought, now how do you feel about that? He tried to rape me today. Good thing I'm a good screamer because he took off, you know. So when Potiphar found out, yeah, he was angry. But I kind of wonder what made him most mad. Right, let's take a look at this. Genesis 39, 19. It says, now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she, she spoke to him, saying, this is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. So I always wondered, was it, was it the fact that Joseph allegedly attacked his wife? Do you think he didn't know what kind of woman his wife was? I mean, let's just be honest about something. I mean... If your wife's a floozy, you probably know that. Am I right? Just throwing it out there, right? If the husband's a player, she probably knows that. You know what I mean? They're pretty perceptive when you've been married long enough. So he probably knew what kind of woman he was married to, right? But he also knew that he couldn't ignore this. But I wonder what made him more mad, the fact that she allegedly was attacked by him or the fact that the guy who made it to where all he had to worry about was what he was going to have for dinner was going to be canned. Which one do you think he was really the most mad about? I'd say it's the latter of the two that he was more mad about, right? But think about it, I get it. He was in an impossible situation, right? If he ignores it, it makes his wife look terrible. And also, other servants might try to get away with what she accused him of, and they might actually do it. I get why he had to do it, right? 
So he had to put him in jail, but you can bet he didn't like it. And you can bet the biggest reason he didn't like it was because there went his cash cow, right? He didn't really have any choice. Now, I'll bet at this point the enemy was laughing, thinking he finally silenced one of God's most faithful servants. I imagine that's where we were at right here. Because the enemy knows people who have faith like that of Joseph, they are the biggest threat to him, right? They're the biggest threat to him. So he's always trying to silence people like that. The enemy also knows that God blesses true faithfulness even in trying circumstances. And he doesn't want people knowing that. So for every one of God's blessings, he comes up with a counter to try to get you to forget about that blessing. But the same faithfulness that brought you through the first trial will bring you through the second. And that's what Joseph's going to show us. One thing you're going to find out about Joseph was he didn't look at where he was now. He looked at where he was going. Right? He knew what God's promises were. I think sometimes Christians are short-sighted. I think sometimes we put all of our focus on what we get here. Right? I was talking to a, a guy one time, and he was going on and on about everything God didn't give him. Right? And it was an exhausting list of the things God didn't give him. And every time I'd get the phone call, it was, where is God? What's God doing? Why am I still in this job going on and on? And one day I asked him, I said, listen, if the only thing God ever did through your faith was guarantee heaven for you and deliver you from hell, would it make him a good enough God to serve? He goes, well, yeah, yeah, it would. And I said, well, you wouldn't know it. Because it sounds like to me, the only way you're gonna be happy is not the promise of heaven, but the promise of wealth, the promise of having things. I think we get short-sighted. Listen, we have to remember, we're going to have struggles in this life. That's going to happen. This world is broken. Did you know that? When we fell in the garden, and people say, it wasn't we. If you'd have been there, you'd have done it too, right? And when we fell in the garden, we didn't just curse humanity. We cursed all of creation. Everything is cursed. This world is broken, okay? And you can't live in a broken, fallen society and expect everything to go well. You're going to have struggles, but you know what gets me by and what gets so many people by is realizing this is not as good as it gets, right? This isn't everything. You know, the other day somebody told me, and I don't know if I should even tell you this, but the other day somebody was telling me, you know, well, what if the Lord comes back, things are getting bad, and you know, nobody knows when God's going to come back. When people tell you that, they're just guessing. The Bible even says even the angels in heaven don't know when the Lord's going to return. But they kept saying, it's just scary right now, scary times right now. The Lord could return, scary times. And finally, I said, that is not scary. Listen, <laughs> any day, Lord, I'm ready to go. My bags are packed. You know what I mean? Sometimes we have to think about the ultimate, the ultimate gift that was given us. That's eternal life. That's the ultimate gift. What made Joseph be so faithful in difficult times? He had his eyes on the promises of God. He knew the promises of God and he fully depended on them. Sometimes I think if we got more focused on the promises of God and less focused on all the things we don't have, we'd have a happier life. Because what you don't have now will pale in comparison to the riches you will have in glory. And I'm not talking about money, okay? Sometimes we have to have that mindset. Now, next week we're gonna take a look at what happens next. Because after Potiphar found this out and threw him in jail, it looks like this is the end of him. But there's a lot more. Let's go ahead and close there. We'll pick up there next week. I'm going to ask if you would to please bow your heads. We always like to give an invitation. If there's anyone here who would like me to pray for them, just make eye contact with me. Put your head right back down. Bless those people. I don't call you out, but I do pray. Bless those people. Bless those people. Bless those people. I'll be praying. And if you're watching or listening online, God knows your heart. Bless those people. Listen. If you're a believer, think about the message. Think about this. People are watching. And the enemy's trying to distract you from showing them what we're here to show them. We are here to show the love of God, not disdain and anger, not disunity, not judgment, not prejudice. We are here to show people the love and grace of God. And grace means something you get that you don't earn. So we don't walk around looking for people who deserve the love of God. We walk around handing it out to everyone. That's why we're here. So if anything's keeping you from doing that, get rid of it. Let's pray. 
God, we thank you so much for the many blessings you put in our life. We thank you, God, for the promises. Just knowing, God, that we're just passing through this world is so empowering. It feels so good to know, God, that no matter what our financial situation, no matter what our health is like, no matter what our status is in this community or any community, the most important thing about us is that we are yours. God, we just pray that we never stop being thankful for the great gift of eternal life. We thank you that he made it free, that anyone who believes that what Jesus did was enough to guarantee it, you promised you'd give it to them. So I just pray if someone's struggling, remove the doubt and the religion and remind them that you didn't die for religion, you died for redemption. And if they can just believe that what you did was enough, they can have it. And if they make that decision, I pray they contact us. But God, for the believers, it's a difficult time worldwide. The world is in chaos. The only thing that remains true is your promises in your word. Give us a passion for the truth, a passion for you, a passion to serve, so that people can see that we're calm in the storm and we're calm because of your love. We just pray, God, that you go with us as we leave here. Keep us safe. Let us live what we profess. And if you don't return to take us home before we meet again, let us come together one more time and give you all the praise and honor and glory that you're worthy of. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.